afternoon or good evening here in Israel. Uh, just a reminder to all of us that on the Jewish calendar today is Tu Be'av, the 15th of Av, which is perhaps one of the most, if not the second most joyous day in the Jewish calendar. Uh, for me, it also is because it's the day I proposed to Ilana. And even though it was one of the worst proposals in the history of proposals, she said yes. Um, so, so after our class, um, we'll be going out. But we're here to talk about the prophets. Um, and, and when we say prophets, this has got to be, I'm going to share my screen now, um, one of the most sensitive topics, uh, uh, um, I, I think, in Jewish history. And when I say one of the most sensitive topics, um, and this is just like a real brief intro, um, it seems that sort of the Jewish people have, have a sort of a, a problematic history with their prophets. And when I say a problematic history, I mean... Um, the Jewish people, the Israelites, have never listened to their prophets uh, throughout the Bible. Uh, um, you know, the, the only ones in the Bible that listened to a prophet were, were the people of Nov, right, who listened to, to Jonah. Um, but, but, but what we want to do here is we want to really try and understand what does it mean to be a prophet? What is prophecy? And we're going to start biblical. We're going to start with just sort of really, because, you know, when you think about it, the word navi is an enigma in itself. What does Navi mean? We're going to go to the first instance where it starts. We're going to try and understand what Navi means. And then we're going to take a little journey uh, into the medieval era, where we're going to look at Moses Maimonides, perhaps the greatest Jewish philosopher who ever lived. And we're going to view his take on, on, on what, what prophecy is, how it's acquired. We're then going to shift to our mystics, to two mystics that have two very different uh, 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 modes of, of prophecy and, and how it is acquired. One is going to be Rabbi Avraham Abu Lafia, a fascinating, fascinating character. Uh, we're talking early 13th century. We'll touch upon him. And he had this sort of, perhaps we could say prophecy as a, as a, as a sort of the highest form of meditation. And then we're going to shift to Rabbi Yosef Ben Shalom Ashkenazi, a mystic, a sort of contemporary of Abu Lafia. And we're going to look at prophecy as a sort of divine astrology. These three models that we're going to see, Maimonides, Abu Lafia, and Ashkenazi, are all talking prophecy. However, they, they both at times are going to be miles apart, and we're going to be left with this sort of trying to sort of understand still what does it mean, and perhaps what does it mean today? Is there, is there such a thing? And in between, we're going to look at some, some one, one specific contemporary voice. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, this, by the way, is, uh, is Zachariah, who we see here. It's, uh, uh, um, it's, on, it's in the Sistine Chapel. This is a, a beautiful fresco painted by Michelangelo. Uh, um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because we see here Zachariah, one of the last prophets. He has, you know, these famous prophecies of, of children who are going to be playing in, in Jerusalem and old people sitting down watching the children playing with a ball. And it, it's this, there's this beautiful saying of Zachariah in the heart of the old city of Jerusalem today, where you can see old people and children playing with the ball. Uh, um, and, and, and we're going to try and understand how to, what is Zechariah reading? What does he see? Who are these two angelic characters behind him? So this is a sort of visual we're going to keep in the back of our minds. Okay. So let's start with the first instance where the word Navi, prophet, and I'm just going to say Navi without saying yet what it means. We're the first time it appears in the Bible, okay, because I'm going to assume we have no idea what the word prophet means. Our view today of prophets is predominantly uh, 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 determined by conceptions that have crept into our mind, either through TV, through books. But, but let's go back to the beginning. Tabula rasa, we know nothing. So we're starting with, with the Bible. So we're, we're in Genesis. We're only 20 chapters into Genesis. We're still with Abraham. But, and so the background of this verse is Abraham has gone down to Egypt with his lovely wife, Sarah, and Avimelech there is, is, is the king. And Abraham doesn't tell Avimelech that Sarah is his wife. Why? Because he's afraid that, you know, they might kill him, take her, who knows what. Okay. So in the meantime, Avimelech has taken Sarah for himself because Abraham says she's my sister. This is the background to the first time the word prophet appears. So this drama. But now. Return the man's wife. This is God speaking to Avimelech in, 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 in perhaps a dream. 
But now return the man's wife, Abraham's wife, for he is a prophet and he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not return her, be aware that you shall surely die. Okay. Now, this is fascinating. This is absolutely fascinating because, because what we actually see here is a double take on prop. We actually have here supposedly two prophets, right? Because Avimelech, even though the Bible doesn't tell us this, Avimelech de facto seems to be a prophet in our modern view, right? Prophecy in a sort of basic, the basic notion of prophecy is, you know, God speaking to someone. Let's just keep it simple because it's going to get a lot more complicated. So we have here God in a prophetic revelation to Avimelech, telling him about another prophet. And that's the first time the word appears. Okay, Avimelech a prophet. but he's appearing to Avimelech, prophet, and the Bible hasn't told us what it means. Navi, it's it, it, in Hebrew, Navi. First time the word appears. Now, um, the, oh wait, we're missing here. To, right, sorry, okay, this is what I wanted to bring next, then we'll go back. Now, Rashi, eh, 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 Rabbi Shlomo Bar uh, you know, living in, in the uh, uh, 10th, 10th century or 11th century, early 11th century, um, you know, one of the greatest commentators of the Bible, Rashi, in that he, he explains the simple meaning of the Bible. Now, if you go to Rashi, in the first time this word appears, Navi, there is no explanation. And that's quite odd, because this is a word that we have not come across yet, and Rashi sees no need to explain it. Now, what's fascinating, that Rashi's grandson, this guy, Rabbi Shmuel ben Meir, he is the grandson of Rashi, he sees what his grandfather hasn't commentated and says, oh, this, this seems like a pretty important word. And what does he say? For he is a prophet. This is the verse. And how does Rabbi Shmuel ben Meir, the Rashbam, explain this? Deriving from speech of the lips, right? Navi, in Hebrew, speech of the lips, niv sfatain. Speech of the lips, literally. Now, where does he get this from? He gets this from a verse in Isaiah, who was a prophet. We'll get to this in a moment. And, here's, and so, so he first says the literal meaning of Navi, of prophet, is speech of lips. So it's someone whose lips talk. He is now, what does God feel about this person who has this sort of uh, autonomous speech of lips? He is with me frequently and speaks my words, and I love his words and hear his prayers. Okay, so we have here a working definition, one of the earliest we have, amongst biblical commentators, that is. And we are told, A, Navi, literally, prophet means speech of lips. We don't really know what that means. But we know that this character who has speech of lips is clearly loved by God, frequents God, and God hears his prayers. Okay, now we want to understand, before we really start our show, what is this speech of lips? So it's a verse in Isaiah which says, I create, this is Isaiah quoting, sort of being prophetic about God. And Isaiah says, I create, the, I create the speech of lips. Now, we still don't know what this means, I create the speech of lips. We just know that Rashi's grandson has decided to use this verse to explain to us what prophecy is. So for this, we're going to go to the, 20, to the 20th century or 21st century. We're going to go to uh, um, the, the 20th century, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, right, Chabad, and on the, the sort of day commemorating the passing of his, uh, of, of the, the, the Rebbe before him, Rabbi Shmuel Schneerson, he tells us the following. He explains to us what I create the speech of lips means. And what does he say? For the speech of lips are words that come about on their own. That is from the lips themselves, meaning the words do not derive from uh, the uh, thought, sorry, there's a type of thought or intention, but from themselves, that something new has been created, which did not exist beforehand, for instant, for instance, renewal through creation ex nihilo. Wow. Wow. I, I'm not sure we understand the magnitude of, of, of what the Lubavitcher Rebbe has just told us now. He says to us that, I, that speech of lips means, and this goes back to our working definition here of what Rashi's grandson is saying, is that someone who is a prophet, someone that has nifs for time, his lips, his or her lips, utter words, 
and it's not coming from their thought or intention. These are like God created the world, creation ex nihilo, something out of nothing. So too, the prophet, when he is being or she is being prophetic, words are coming out and we're not thinking about them. Okay. Okay. So, so this, is, this is a working definition. Now, many questions come to mind and I want to bring in a little bit of tension before we start with our first character with Maimonides. The first one is, why do we need prophecy? And we're not going to try and answer this. We're going to have this in the back of our mind. What meaning? Clearly from the first instance that we have a prophet, this is, this is someone who, uh, um, this is someone that God speaks to. This is someone that is interaction with God. Is this for God? Is this for mankind? Is this for the prophet? Is it for the specific individual that can handle the truth? Is this specific individual meant to have a task, an ethical task, somehow bettering society? Or does God need our help? Right, well, what's going on here? Um, um, Michael, we have two options. One is I can answer, you know, sort of, I can let you jump in now. We can wait to the end. I've been told to sort of flow, but what, it, 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 if it can wait, we can, we'll continue in that way. We'll go with, uh, um, you're good. Okay, awesome. So we'll keep on, we'll hold the question. Okay, uh, just because I've gotten instructions, but if, if, it's, if someone has a question that they can't and it's sort of important for the, for the flow of it, so just, just jump in, don't worry. Okay. So, so these are questions in the back of our mind. Actually, let's okay. say one thing, because it actually goes with the flow right here. Yes. Yes. So the words from the lips, as you describe them, are very similar to an artist or a musician's creating. So yeah, we're gonna, oh, it's Michael, not, I, I can't believe it. You're, you're quoting Heschel that we're about to see right now. It's exactly. like it's out of body. You're like, well, you're on stage performing. You're almost watching yourself perform music. It's not coming from you. It's coming through you. Amazing. Or a painter. The same thing. It, it does, it's not from you, it's through you. Anyway. It, it, so the, beautiful, beautiful. Now, now and, and this then raises the question, who needs this? Who needs this? Is this idea of prophecy, of something that clearly is not from within us, is this for ourselves? Is this us connecting to ourselves? Is this for God? Is this us connecting to God? And how do the others around us come into this picture? If I'm, say, if I go with Michael, a poet in a cave, and I have this divine inspiration and I write something, and I haven't done anything with that, with that beautiful poem, am I still a prophet? So these are some of the things we're, we're going to sort of try and touch about and leave time in the end to, to discuss. Okay. Abraham Joshua Heschel. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, he wrote his dissertation, his doctorate, on the prophets. He's sitting in Berlin. Before he, he moves to, right, we all know of Heschel, right? Heschel, the famous photo. He's walking with a Sefer Torah with Martin Luther King. He's the embodiment of, of many things in Jewish history. Some might even say prophecy, but we'll put that aside. Um, and so he writes his dissertation in Berlin, in German. And then, you know, being that his, his Yiddish, his German, his Hebrew, his English were simply beautiful. Read him in Hebrew, read him in Yiddish, read him in any language. He's one of the greatest Articula articulations, the moment where, where man, a, a being, is able to articulate themselves into words, Heschel. And how does he start his book? This book is about some of the most disturbing people who ever lived. Wow, what, what a beginning. And here's what's, to me, fascinating about this beginning. When we read the Bible, especially the five books of Moses, before we get to the prophets that the Israelites didn't listen to, but this verse about Abraham, the Bible upon its surface is looking at the prophets from the angle of God. We don't, we, we, we rarely think about what's going on in the prophet, what led to the prophets gaining this and, and what broch, as we say in Yiddish, what, what, what pickly situations, sticky situations are they about to get themselves into for, for being part of this experience. And now I'm just going to throw a few things that I want us to be in the back of our mind. This is again, this is Heschel. And then we're going to keep on. This is, again, part of this is relating to this dynamic of person versus God. The prophet is a person, not a microphone. The prophet was a person who said no to his society, condemning its habits and assumptions. He was often compelled to proclaim the very opposite of what his heart expected. The prophet is not only a prophet. He's also, also a poet, right, Michael? He's a poet, a preacher, a patriot, a statesman, 
a social critic, a moralist. Why do I bring these beautiful words of Heschel at the very outset? Because to my mind, they help complete the picture of what the first instance in the Bible is showing us, which is from God viewing a, a, a prophet. So there's this relationship between God and prophet. And then Heschel in a 20th century mindset is looking at the prophet through the other angle of prophet and society. And this is very important to look at this triangle. Okay, the rest is history. Now we're gonna look at three models. We're, we're gonna try and sort of keep it, you know, sort of these are, you know, these are, you know, complicated matters. We're gonna try and keep it simple. So first is Moses Maimonides. So Maimonides, he, he, the statue here, he's born in Cordova. He gets his first degree in Fez in Morocco. He then heads to, to Egypt, where among other things, he is the, the, the private you know, MD, the doctor of the, the Sultan of, of Egypt. He writes an incredible amount to do with Jewish law. He writes the Guide of the Perplexed, which, which ultimately is a bridge between philosophical thinking in Athens and, and, and the biblical mindset in Jerusalem right there is a need for this bridge because we need to reconcile between Aristotle and, and, and between certain anthropomorphic, you know, sort of human-like figures attributed to God in the Bible that don't really make sense. Um, and the guy of the perplexed, one of the things that is dealt with, you know, to great extent is prophecy. What is prophecy? Who can become a prophet? And this is part of, an, and why do I mention that the sort of part of the Maimonidean project is building a bridge between Athens and Jerusalem because through this prism, we must look at his definitions of prophet. Okay, so let's start. And, and this, of course, is prophecy as, as human perfection. Because remember that for Aristotle and Plato, to a certain extent, part of the, the, the sort of, you know, philosophical teaching and the whole goal of it, ethically speaking, is how do we refine and perfect ourselves? So in the guide, the second part of the Guide of the Perplexed, Moses Maimonides, uh, um, you know, early 11th century, 10th prophecy is a certain perfection in the nature of man so it's an ideal okay it's an ideal now let's see so so who who can achieve this now I, i'm bringing a quote here from his halachic from his you know his sort of his writings on jewish law even though you'll find similar things in the guide of the perplexed so the spirit of prophecy only rests upon the wise man who is distinguished by great wisdom um a strong moral character whose passions never overcome him in anything whatsoever, but who by his rational, facu rational faculty has his passions under control and possesses a broad and sedate mind. So we're basically talking about a perfect human being, right? So someone who any of us rarely meet. We're talking about someone that has the IQ of Einstein, that is the perfect ubermensch. And what I haven't brought here, but he, he's sort of hinting at towards the end, is someone who is a leader someone who's a real leader. So it's someone that, that, that has sort of very, very sophisticated cognitive capabilities. So it's, you know, we're talking mathematical, we're talking scientific, but then you also need to have that poetic aspect to you to, to be able to, when prophecy comes about us, and we're going to get to that in a moment, when prophecy comes about, we need to be able to analyze into symbols that can be articulated what it is that we've seen, right? Because th there is some message we are getting. We're not sure yet where it's from. We're getting some message. And there are three, there are three levels here. You need to have that IQ according to Maimonides to be able to even take in what is being passed on to you. You need to be of the highest ethical level because otherwise you're not worthy as a human being to even receive this. You then need to be a very creative person with lots of EQ in order to be able to translate whatever this divine prophecy is. And most importantly, you need to be a leader because if it stays within you, what have we done here? Okay. Now, what is, what is this prophecy? According to Maimonides, and I didn't bring this text because like I said, we're dealing with sort of, you know, there's a lot of material to cover here and I just want to give us a flavor. According to Maimonides, essentially, it is we are, we are reaching the innermost part of our sechel, of our mind. There is some godly aspect within the innermost part of our mind that not everyone can reach. It's a bit elitist. Not everyone can reach it because you have all this criteria. 
But if you have these criteria and you work hard at it and you've learned all the science and you've learned, right, there's this whole, it was a curriculum, a set curriculum in Greece, which then moves on with Maimonides and you need to learn your biology and chemistry and so on and so forth. After you've learned all the physics, you then learn metaphysics, meaning you've put everything that we know out there into your mind. You've worked at being the best person you can be. You're articulate, you're a leader, meaning it's not going to be a waste of time for from wherever this divine prophecy is, is, is coming into you. And then something happens. What happens? So what happens is, and we're going to get back to what this God is. Prophecy occurs only in a vision or in a dream. When a prophet prophesies, he sometimes sees a parable. Sometimes he sees God, may be exalted in a vision of prophecy speaking to him. We need to make a very important distinction when we talk about prophecy, according to Maimonides. We can talk about God speaking to us in a dream, but we absolutely cannot talk about God speaking to us. There's a huge difference. It's, it's, it's happening in our mind. Okay, for, for my and, and Maimonides was was attacked for this. He was he was brutally attacked for this. Why? Because as part of the Maimonidean practice, he's looking at certain verses in the Bible, like when Abraham sees angels approaching his tent, and Maimonides says it, 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 it was an epiphany. It was it was a prophecy that ha occurred within a dream because you cannot possibly see an angel. He was attacked for this because if the Bible says he saw prophets, then, you know, if, if Jacob is struggling with an angel, no, according to Maimonides, Jacob did not struggle with an actual angel. That didn't happen. What happened was there's no doubt it happened, but that whole episode, episode happened in here. So it's a revolutionary way of, of even looking at certain episodes in the Bible because it's saying they happened, but they happened in here. Now, what does this mean? It means that the prophet, the Prophecy is perfection, according to Maimonides, is getting into the deepest place we can get into here. There are secrets in here that not everyone is going to be able to get to, and only those who work very hard will be able to get something. And then what is the end game? And there is no doubt about this. Maimonides writes about this. It is in order to bring the unlock to the fullest what you can understand about this world and pass it on to others. The prophet becomes a teacher. If you've reached this, this perfect moment, you've gained this knowledge, then you need to do with it something. You need to be writing books. Now, Maimonides, and, and, and this is something that has to be said for the next two characters we're going to deal with, even though he's a philosopher and a lot of his writing at times seems like he's being very descriptive and giving us a lot of information, Maimonides has certain codes. He has a certain as a, as a, as a, as a esoteric style of writing that built in ensures that anyone can read him, but not everyone is going to understand him. At times, this will be manifest by, by different contradictions. At times, it'll be by a mode in Hebrew called Rashi Prakim. Rashi Prakim means sort of notes. He'll drop a note here in chapter one, he'll drop a note here in chapter 20, and you're meant to connect the dots. You're meant to put these things together. He wants you to work hard. And he can't say everything because, again, according to his own definition, only the worthy, only the person that can reach these to the fullest will, will be able to do something with this. Okay. So thus far, what we have is we have a prophet who, this is going with Arist Aristotelian philosophy. The goal here is to perfect ourselves, but not for ourselves, but in order to teach society. Another important caveat, as we noted, is that you're not really talking to God, but it's, it's something within us. Now, here's, here's something super important. And now I'm going to drop a bomb because it's, it's a bomb that must be dropped because it's going to now basically contradict everything I've just said. Okay. And then we're going to move on. All that, all that we've just said is true for all the prophets, except one, except Moses. Maimonides tells us, and what are you going to do with this, that Moses was the only prophet that God could speak to almost face to face. Everything I've just told you now with Moses was different. Now, this is this is incredible, right? This, this is how you build a bridge between Athens and Jerusalem. It has to have a bridge with a lot of little places where people can fall down in the middle if you're not careful. Right. Because what he's saying here is I have a working definition and this is the way it usually goes, but not with Moses. You know, so, so this is just like a bomb that we need to sort of drop. But but I but I still think it doesn't what it doesn't change, which is very important, 
is that Maimonides firstly is creating a hierarchical uh, uh, um, elitist mode. It is about human perfection. He's using ultimately inspired by Moses as the model of the ultimate leader that does somehow tap into what we can get within ourselves. And in the case of Moses, through God, in order to pass on. Okay. 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 This, this is Maimonides. Now, it's important also because Maimonides is the role model for the two next characters we're going to deal with, even though they're, they're Kabbalists, they are mystics, they are supposedly worlds apart. Okay. So our first one, and this is already moving into prophecy as meditation. Okay. Um, Avram Abulafia. Uh, Abraham Abulafia may be the, the, the cool looking guy we see here in this manuscript. This is a manuscript from the uh, uh, mid 13th century, I think 1240. Uh, who is Avram Abulafia? Abraham Abulafia, uh, he's born in Saragossa in Spain. Um, he gets a basic education. He's not a rabbi. He doesn't learn he heavy Gemara Talmud, but he learns the basic curriculum. And, and, and then he, he gets into the Guide of the Perplexed. He's reading Moses Maimonides, and you know he's, he's fascinated by the guide. In fact, he's so fascinated by the Guide of the Perplexed that he writes not one, not two, but three commentaries, three different commentaries on Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed. He then, because he's in Spain, and in this time he gets into Kabbalah, he gets into mysticism as well. In a nutshell, um, what he's interested in in Kabbalah is using the names of God. He's interested in how in Barcelona at this time, mid 13th century in Barcelona, the book that Kabbalists are interested in is Sefer Yetzirah. And what is Sefer Yetzirah about? It is an early, supposedly early second temple book. There's debate about when it was written, um, but essentially it's a very short 1800 give or take word document about how God created the world through words. And then the assumption is that if we can understand how God created the world through the Hebrew alphabet, the mystic, the Kabbalist can use this to create as well. Okay. But, but, but this isn't where Abulafia is going. Abulafia sees Maimonides. He reads Maimonides and understands perfectionist prophecy. He's also there, perfectionist prophecy. Yet he adds a mystical layer into the Maimonidean model. He buys everything Maimonides says, but what Abulafia is interested in is writing guides. He writes manuscript leaf upon manuscript leaf of how to achieve prophecy. And he gets kicked out of Spain for this. He gets kicked out by, by Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Adret, kicked out by the leading rabbi because he's saying, you know, you, you're just, you're, you're going bonkers. You're, just to sort of understand the sort of character that Abu Lafia was, at some point he, he practices his own medicine, you know, how to use letters. And we're going to see this in a moment. And it leads him to a vision that he has to go and speak to the Pope. He has to go and speak to the Pope. And he sends message to the Pope, um, got the name the pope at the time he, he writes he sends message to the pope i want to see you the pope basically sends back a message saying if you come i'm going to kill you abulafia heads to rome he is arrested he is arrested you know he enters rome he's arrested and interestingly right uh, the pope in the meantime dies and as a result a month later abulafia is let out of prison and, and he spends the rest of his days in sicily and italy isolated writing, continuing, perfecting his writings because he can't go back to Spain. And he's passing on what becomes prophetic Kabbalah, which is not about the spherotic Godhead. It is interested in perfecting Moses Maimonides' idea of prophecy through cloaking it with Sefer Yetzirah uh, 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 um, methods of meditation using the Hebrew alphabet. And this is what it looks like. Okay. If you open a, an Abulafia manuscript, um, you're not going to understand much. I mean, no. So it's very frustrating opening an Abulafia manuscript because it starts with very clear descriptions. It starts by telling you things like this passage. Here, let's read this passage. Direct your face toward God, right? So you're looking supposedly up, even though it's interesting, it's actually cryptic because you need to decide where God is. Direct your face to God and consider as if you were a person standing before you waiting for you to speak, and he is prepared to answer everything that you ask him, right? We have Maimonides at the back of our mind. This is the, the, the human perfection. 
Begin with a complete intention. Very important word, kavana. Begin with a complete intention to the glory of God. May he be elevated. And at the start of everything, say, take my prayer as an offering of incense, my upraised hands as an evening sacrifice. You should lift your eyes to the heights and you should raise your right and left hands in the manner of uplifting of the hands of the priest who separates five fingers on each side. The two small ones are conjoined as one and the two that are close to them. And there is a space in the middle, right, like this. Uh, and there is a space in the middle. Uh, 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 and right, what goes in the middle, his tongue med mediates between the two, like the tongue of the scale. Then he, be he can begin to mention the name, right? This is from uh, Elliot Wolfson's beautiful uh, translation uh, uh, from his monograph on Abu Lafia. Now, so, so many of Abu Lafia's texts, there are, there are at least three, if not more, but essential, uh, uh, usually it's Chaye Olam Abba, Imre Shefer, if it doesn't mean anything to us, it's okay. There are several books that he wrote that are de dealing with prophetic technique. And they start with very clear passages like this, and then you get to these concentric circles. Then you get to this, this, this form of meditating where you're focusing on certain letters and you're meant to go through certain patterns in your mind, circular patterns, right? In certain areas of the manuscript, he is purposely writing around circles because the idea is you are meant to, and, and the cyclical theme is, is very important. This goes back to even to Sefer Yetzirah. Note there are a few things here that are interesting that, that sort of echo Sefer Yetzirah without getting into it. The idea of the tongue mediating, but like a scale. This is very Sefer Yetzirah. This idea of sort of how to create perfect harmony in the cosmos. And notice another interesting thing about this text is that I, I don't know how many of you have picked up on this, but what in fact Abu Lafia is pointing at here is that we no longer have a holy temple, right? We have had the destruction of the holy temple. There is only one temple left in town, and that's you, the prophet, right? We have your working model of man, prophet, acting as a holy temple. You are embodying the holy temple. This is wild stuff. This is, this is total embodiment of the holy temple through meditation. Now, this is a kvetch that does not appear in Maimonides. This is Abu Lafia. This is Abu Lafia being influenced by Kabbalists that can't touch Jerusalem. They can't touch Israel. So we create. We create a, an alternative reality within our minds, within our hearts. We are cleaving to God. It is about, for, my monitor, for, for, for Abu Lafia, the prophetic experience of meditation is about cleaving to God. And when we cleave, and where is God's home? What does God want most? The holy temple. So man, the prophet, becomes the holy temple to cleave to God. Now, these are important distinctions, as I mentioned, because it, in a way we're sort of, we're, we're going up from Maimonides. We're sort of, we're becoming more symbolic. Something else is happening in the mind of the prophet. Now, notice for a moment, we are miles away from Kansas. And when I say Kansas, I mean that first, that first verse we looked at about Abraham and God calling him a prophet. Look at what's going on here. This is, the, you know, in the medieval era, we are fascinated with the following. In the Bible, it seems there is this sense that God chooses. There is this de deterministic decision made by God, a divine decree of who becomes prophet. And then something happens in the medieval era where man decides to take action and say, I want to find a method of how I can become prophet. It's, it's bottom up. And if you ask me, I think this has a lot to do with the Talmud. What do I mean? We, whoever was in the class, I spoke about the four books that changed Jewish history. I note that in the Talmud, rabbis, an invention of the Talmud, rabbis killed the biblical prophets. Rabbis said there is no longer prophecy. Why? What is the problem with prophets? That they are uncertain. Why are prophets an uncertain uh, uh, source of knowledge? Because we don't know when God is going to appear. There is a very big epistemological problem with prophecy as a source of information because I don't know when it's going to happen. I, you know, and so rabbis create the longest standing revolution in Jewish history and say, we are now going to decide. We are going to start asking questions. 
and this is how we're going to find our answers. So, so if you ask me, I think what part of what's going on here in the medieval era of us, of, of these texts that are trying to look from the other way around and say, no, it's no longer uh, top down, it's bottom up. It's part of a continuation of a striving, starting from the Talmud, 2000 or 1,500 years before these texts are written, saying we want to take power because too long we were walking in the desert, not sure what's happening. So interestingly, in the medieval era, there is a renewal of prophecy. But interestingly, it, it's following this, this, this revolutionary idea of the Talmud, which talks about ultimately mankind taking power. So, so this is continuing with this, but saying now we are going to bring that to the prophets our way. And so there's this fascination with how, how to achieve this. Now, so we've spoken about the idea of embodying a temple and, and, and Abu Lafia talks a lot about Hitbodedut. Abu Lafia talks a lot about this idea of, of you need to go far away to a place where there are no people, where there's complete quiet. You need quiet, you know, today, in, in Israel, you can still see this. You can, if you go to, to we have tiny forests. They're not quite like, you know, Robin Hood forest at, at land, you know, in the UK, but we have a little bit of tuft of forest between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And there, if you go in certain evenings, you can hear Breslov Hasidim who are doing hit bodedut. There are some caves outside of Jerusalem where if you're lucky on a Thursday night, you might even hear one of them screaming out, Abba, Abba, in the peak of a meditative uh, uh, practice. You need to be alone. Maimonides, by the way, talks about the need of music, the need of being joyous. You need to be in a certain state of mind. Abu Lafi is taking this to the next level. And there's this focus on letters. There is this focus on sound. Once we've gotten our mind into the certain rhythm by focusing on the name of God, we need to follow a certain practice. What is this practice? We need to go through the four letters of God's name, right? The Tetmogrammaton, so Yud, K, Vav, K, and every letter, every time with a different sound. There are five different vowels, you know, we have, uh, depending if you're from Ashkenaz or if you're from Sfarad, you either have five or six, and you need to go with certain sounds in your mind. So you're humming. You're by yourself, you're alone, you're humming. And the idea, much like, by the way, anyone who meditates today, the name of the game of, in meditation is focus on one thing, isolate everything else. If you can get to a place where you're thinking about nothing and the way to get to nothing is by focusing on one thing. When I focus on one thing, I'm able to take everything out and then get to a different place. So Maimonides is using the name of God. He's using the Hebrew alphabet because he understands that if God used these letters to create the world, these are my way to connect to God. These are my way to become a prophet. One more thing in brackets before we move to our last bit uh, is that there is a huge debate amongst philosophers and Kabbalists, the names of things in the world, right? This, this is a coffee cup. Uh, this is a glass of water. Who named these? Are the names of all objects in existence were they accepted by man? Did Adam, the first person, the first people give names because they just made sense? Or are they from, do they originate in the divine? Now, the, the difference of where you stand is huge because if you believe that cafe, the word coffee, cafe, kuf, pay, hey, is, is originate somewhere above where it was created, it has huge ramifications in terms of meditating, in terms of what you can do with this, as we're about to see in one moment in our final destination. So it's not for nothing that Abu Lafi is focusing on the Hebrew al alphabet because he believes, unlike philosophers, that every single letter and name in existence is divinely given. And as such, I'm going to focus on the very letters, the Tetmogrammaton, that created all of these in order to understand the deeper meaning of every single thing in the natural and supernatural world. Okay, and, and now we bring down the curtain on Abu Lafia and we are ready to head to our third destination. Um, a contemporary of Abu Lafia, as I mentioned, Yosef Ben Shalom Ashkenazi. Yosef Ben Shalom Ashkenazi is like Abu Lafia, heavily influenced by Maimonides. So there's this idea that prophecy is important, prophecy exists, we are going top, uh, bottom up, and we're interested in, 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 in achieving this. If Maimonides talks about 
prophecy as perfection. If Abu Lafia talks about prophecy as meditation, then with Ashkenazi, we can talk about prophecy as divine astrology. This is what the manuscript looks. This is an example of a manuscript Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi wrote a commentary on Sefer Yetzirah, which as we know already with Abu Lafia is super important for the things we're talking about. And we have all of these, what you see here, these concentric circles is called a volvula. And a volvula is, is meant, now what you have here is three circles. At the outer circle, we have a name of God. The, it's combinations of names of God, get this. When God appears to Moses in the burning bush, Moses says to him, I'm gonna go back to Egypt. I need something, give me something to convince them that I saw you, that I heard you, that I'm a prophet. And God says, eheye asher eheye. I will be what I will be, or I am what I am. Take it as you will. There are many different ways of translating this. Check what Robert Alta did with it. Um, but this, this is the outer circle. This is the furthest circle away. Eheye asher eheye is the highest level. Then in the middle, we have the Tetragrammaton, and we have, we don't really know what we're looking at. So let's try and understand what we're looking at. Okay. Ashkenazi tells us that astrologer astrologer appears in 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 in, uh, in the commentary the earliest commentary on genesis rabba on on you know the act of creation so words from greek creep into the jewish jargon in the talmud and in the midrash and so ashkenazi wants to explain the greek word astrologos astrologer and here's he gives it a little kabbalistic vetch he says astrologer meaning one who gazes at the 12 concealed names of a heyer what we have here is a Jose Beshemot. We don't have here, meaning for Ashkenazi, and we're going to get to this in a moment because Ashkenazi, unlike Abu Lafia, Abu Lafia wants to write supposedly very clearly. He writes guides of how to become a prophet. Ashkenazi is much more like Maimonides in the sense that he's not interested in revealing all that much. You've got to really work hard. And so he scatters his secrets. And so in one book, he gives us a working definition and says that the name of the game is gazing at the names, right? You can hear the echo of Abu Lafia. You're gazing at the names of God. We still don't know why or for what purpose. Okay. If we now look closer at these concentric circles, we've just received a working definition that the Jewish astrologer, the Kabbalistic astrologer, the prophetic astrologer is one that is not gazing at the stars, but is one that is gazing at the spherot at the Godhead that determined the flow of the stars. Here's the model. For Ashkenazi, where we have a problem. What's our problem? Our problem is, is, is astrological determination. It can't possibly be that if you're born at a certain time, that that's it, that's your luck. But it can. How do we, how do we mediate between being born at a certain time? And for Ashkenazi, make no mistake, if you're born with a certain luck, that is your luck. That's what you're born with. So the model is as follows. We have the constellations. But what determines the flow, the influx from the constellations and your supposed luck are the spherotic Godhead. And what can manipulate or bend God's will? This is important. This is very sticky. The right combinations of the names of God. Meaning, if you can master the different names of God, then you, you can start doing things with, you can influence the spherotic Godhead through the combinations of letters of the name of God, which then change your luck. This is the start of our model. Okay. We still don't know where we're going with this. Okay. We're, we're going to skim through this to, to leave time for questions and answers. In a nutshell, Ashkenazi's material we have here, for example, a picture which shows us the sun in the middle and the sun ontologically, get this, the sun ontologically is connected to the yud ke vav ke name of God. What does this mean? It means that the sun and the moon and the stars determine your luck. But what determines your reincarnations? What determines the flow of your soul through history are the spiritual bits that are ontologically connected to the sun, to the moon, and the constellations. And that is the various names of God and the spherotic Godhead. So, so 
For the sun and the moon from which light and darkness come, they are the cause of all generation corruption, right? He's essentially saying that, that the mix between the natural world and the supernatural that dictates the flow of the natural world, if you understand science and you understand metaphysics and you understand Kabbalah, then, then you can understand through the name of a person, the name of a person, if you know when a person, pers right, if you want to understand what a Jewish astrologer is, a prophetic astrologer, a divine gazer, it is knowing the name of a person. It is knowing the point at which they are born, not in order to understand the future. That's boring. What's more important than the future is understanding your past, your previous reincarnations, so that I know then to fix where you're headed. So I know to guide you where you're going. So this, this model, this, this prophetic model of Ashkenazis, and we're just skimming through it because it's just to give us an idea in our mind, is taking astrology, it's, it's taking Kabbalah, it's taking this, the natural world around, around us in order to reach some divine revelation. Okay, because then we can change things. Now, what happens is, according to Ashkenazi, and, and he will conclude, is that there is this idea called God, God's divine providence is over everything. Inanimate objects, plants, flora, fauna, human beings, angels, spirit of God had everything. Everything transmigrates into everything and everything grows. It goes according to the flow of the sun, the moon, and the stars. And if you want to understand, if you want, as a prophet, your role, your job is to help God navigate. It is to help navigate the world through ensuring that the judgments that are meant to happen are meant to happen. It means that when you see a soul in front of you here, Ashkenazi is becoming an ethical leader and saying the role of the prophet is to see a person in front of me, to see their name, to use my, my name gazing capabilities to be more than an astrologer, but a divine astrologer, to know where they come from, to help them where they're headed. And in that sense, the prophet here is God's shutaf, is God's partner. We have moved, if Maimonides spoke about this idea of leadership, of being a prophet for others, and then Abu Lafia gives us the sense that it comes back to cleaving to God and perhaps for our own experience, albeit somehow for the good of others, Ashkenazi is fully looking at the astro-Kabbalistic system as a prophet to help God navigate the world because things are going wrong all the time and we need we need this rock in the middle to help navigate the ship the right way so this this in a nutshell and, and then get this he says and when you can look at the calculations that i have alluded to you will be able to observe in every moment that you wish the governance the, the governing mode of existence or the name of the 28 modes right we're looking at the the, the, the lunar calendar and understand this it will reveal to you the future according to the secret of the name without needing the work of stargazers for sometimes they lie about certain things. And from here, you can understand the prayers and the secret of actions. And he concludes, each and every inanimate being, plant, animal, human, element, orbs, everything. They, are all, they all receive vitality from the 12 modes of existence, from the names, which influence the stars. And this is the path and strength of the Lord's prophets. Right? This is wild. He's, he's saying the reason that any and one of us go to an astrologer and astrologers, we've heard stories that they get it right. And sometimes they get it wrong, according to, to Ashkenazi, is because they, they're not looking at the divine names as a way of completing the picture. OK, so, so we've concluded our three modes, Maimonides, Abu Lafi, Ashkenazi. Um, and I want to keep in the background this quote by Heschel, um, which, which, which is looking again. At, at the problem, right? His fundamental obje obje objective, the prophets, was to reconcile between man and God. And this is what's constantly been interesting us, man, God, and society. Why do the two need reconciliation? Right? Why do we need a prophet? Perhaps it is due to man's false sense of sovereignty, to his abuse of freedom, to his aggressive, sprawling pride, resenting God's involvement in history. Prophecy ceased, supposedly. 
The prophets endure and can only be ignored at the risk of our own despair. It is for us to decide whether freedom is self-assertion or response to a demand, whether the ultimate situation is conflict or concern. So, so Heschel's powerful words bring back this, this, this question that we started with was, why do we need prophets? What is this all about? And we haven't attempted to answer this question. What we'd, we've attempted to do is go on an intellectual quest back in time to view three different models rooted in this early biblical instance of prophecy in order to try and think about this, to try and see how it relates to, to our knowledge of Jewish texts, to the idea of prophecy, and what it means for us today. Um, so that's, that's the story. We're going to open up now for, for we have just under 10, 10 minutes or 10 minutes of questions. Uh, or comments, um, the, the floor is open. Um, I see we have a few, right. Um, uh, very interesting. Yes, Michael. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, had I, I put some thoughts in, in the, uh, <laughs> I was kind of rambling in the, in the uh, chat box as my thoughts came up. Um, but um, just big picture going back, kind of as I perceive, perceive it, I'll somewhat use interchangeably prophets with mystics, okay? And I know they're really not interchangeable, but they over, there's an overlap, I think. And, and I always view Judaism and looking back over, over the millennium as was really a mystic driven religion until the Talmud. So basically it was, you know, you look at Ezekiel's writings and even the Torah itself, if you, if you read it looking for the, for the hidden, hidden language between the lines, the, the metaphors and the like that we can apply to our lives today, um, it, it was mystic driven. It was driven by people who had direct relationships with God. Okay, as you describe prophets as having, right? The Talmud came along and basically said, no, no, you need rabbis. This is a rabbinic religion. This is not a religion of mystics. And it kind of eviscerated the mystical impact, the mystics impact on our religion. That was brilliant. It held all people together for millennia, you know, but it definitely eviscerated the mystical one-on-one -on -one qualities of our religion for a long time until I guess Moses de Leon came along and then and these Abelafe and those folks who started to re-embrace this. But but you you kind of insinuate that the Talmud was a source of of embracing prophecy where i always looked at it as as something that we've, we've really had to get beyond in order to re-embrace kabbalah so so no so so firstly no okay so in a way yes no no in a way yes i think your comment is spot on um essentially right face value talmud says no longer there are prophets we've killed them we're going somewhere else but the medieval idea of the reawakening of wanting to find the prophet bottom up in a way is, is inspired by the Talmudists, if we call them that, saying we want, to, we want to reclaim power for ourselves. And yet the picture is more complicated. And why is it more complicated? Uh, for two reasons. First, as you mentioned here, say Rabbi Akiva, we have, right, one of the, many times we have uh, um, disagreements supposedly about Jewish law. How do we write? A, how do we light a Chanukia? One, two, three, four, eight, or eight, seven, eight. Uh, many times, the, the different. Uh, the, what is it? The the source of the of the dispute can at times be mystical mystical ideas. Rabbi Akiva, right? In in the tractate of Chagiga, they're having mystical experiences, which which. I don't know any other way of saying other than prophetic. So the idea of mystic mysticism or mystic and prophet is fascinating. To my mind, and here I'll go with Heschel, I think the main difference between a mystic and a prophet um, perhaps is the social connotation, is the social responsibility. Uh, if I look aside from the idea of your, your, your lips, speaking autonomous speech. And the other thing I just want to mention before, before Stephen, before your comment, is if you take, say, a scholar like Israel Knoll, Israel Knoll, a brilliant scholar from, from Hebrew University, he wrote a book recently. Um, I don't know if it's brand, translated to English, but there are many such books which look at the Bible and look at songs in the Bible that are hiding letter combinations and names of God. And there's much to be said about this. I mean, th these things are not, th these are serious scholars that are finding, uh, um, you know, literarily, poetically speaking, balance and certain code 
um, that make you wonder even about, you know, meaning going back to the mystical origins of the Bible. And this is where, again, mystic and prophet becomes, again, a bit of a balagan. And, you know, so what's the relationship between them? Uh, but thanks. That, that That's a brilliant comment. And there's a lot to think about that. Stephen, and then uh, uh, we'll move on. Yes. Okay, so my, my overall question has to do with, it picks up on the final slide that you showed having to do with the principle of freedom. And the overall question that I wanna raise is, you know, free will versus determinism in each of these three thinkers that you have focused on, Maimonides, Abulafia, and Ashkenazi. But let me also raise the point that with Maimonides, you know, you talked about, um, you know, the prerequisites for prophecy being in high intelligence, high ethical character, leadership, uh, and being very articulate. But for Maimonides, there was also a very other important issue, which is that you could have all that and still not be a prophet. God had to choose you, you know, and maybe that was a way that Maimonides excused himself, you know, for not having been a prophet, that he exactly. could have checked the other four boxes, but that number five, you know, he was just an unlucky guy. But it seems to me, given that, you know, to then trace the transition then to Abulafia, who then says, you don't need God to have chosen you, right? So Abulafia, in a way, is eliminating that fifth prerequisite and saying, you can choose to do this yourself. But then that suggests, in a way, a kind of determinism, because it's all determined by your stars, you know, or your, or your name. You know, the name you have been given now determines. So there's issues here of free will versus determinism. And then uh, with Ashkenazi, uh, I'm not sure how it plays out. So I'll, I'll so, throw, throw the ball back to you. So no, so these are great questions. So firstly, in terms of Maimonides, I agree with you 100%. And I, I didn't bring this in, but essentially the, the sort of that caveat that even if you have everything God has to choose you is a very similar play to... All the prophets are like this, but Moses is different, right? Mm -hmm. it's, and it's part of this reoccurring trying to understand what my, my what Maimonides meant. And in that sense, one of the most famous questions, right? Papers have been written about this. Did Heschel wrote about this, right? Uh, uh, did did Maimonides think that he reached prophecy? Did he see, view himself as a prophet? And there also you could argue, you know, did he think he have it or did he not? Now, in terms of determinism, and I agree 100% that with Abulafi and Ashkenazi, and, and Ashkenazi I put with Abulafi together, I think there's no doubt that they've unleashed themselves uh, of this kind of, you know, of this model of it is only, uh, you know, determined by God. Or, although on the surface, it is, you know, one could debate even that angle, but essentially Ashkenazi is the interesting one in that sense, because Ashkenazi, and I didn't, we didn't have time to touch upon all of it, but essentially Ashkenazi believes in determinism to a certain extent, right? Sadiq Viralo, how do you explain a righteous person that suffers? One of his, he has two explanations for this. One of them is reincarnation, meaning you used to be bad. Your punishment now is, is you know, where you come into. And this leads to the second uh, uh, possibility, and that is bad luck. He believes you can have bad luck. However, however, there is this thing called Sod Shar, the secret of possibility. And that is this mechanism of prophecy where through the, the divine astrologer, you are able to change luck. You are able to change the de deterministic cree, decree and even you got punished for a certain, you know, you were reincarnated as, as one thing to another as a result of something, these things can change. So I think with Ashkenazi, because with Abulafia, it's a bit more difficult to determine whether you're sort of a... a your mode of being and what you can do is perhaps like Maimonides in here. With Ashkenazi, yeah. And with Ashkenazi, there's a clear, and this is where he differs from other Kabbalists from the Zohar, there's a lot more of a confluence between man and the natural world, which Zohar is perhaps less interested in. Okay, so one, one more quick follow-up yeah. question. To what extent is the determinism, say, of Abulafia, how, to what extent what, might it have been influenced by contemporary Muslim philosophy that embodied uh, determinism? So that's a tricky question because, okay, there's there's a sect, 10th century, between 8th to 10th century sect uh, in Babylon called Ikhwan Asafa, the Brethren of Purity. They wrote 52 epistles. They wrote an encyclopedic work about magic, about cosmology, about anything and everything. And, and they're Ismaili, 
Ismaili Muslims. And if you read their texts and you compare it to Al Alawis or compare it to other, we don't have one deterministic view in Islam. You know, we have many different trends and views, much like we have amongst Karaites as opposed to other sects, Jewish mystics and so on and so forth. So, so that, that's, that's a huge question. And, and with Abu Lafia, like many of these idiosyncratic characters, you're getting your bookshelf is very diverse. And the more you're wandering around, you're creating these systems which, you know, don't appear with a halachic responses to who's, who's sitting in Barcelona in one place. Um, yes, a, 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 a Galia. Sorry, hi. it's Aglaia. <laughs> Aglaia, hi, nice hi. to meet you. Okay, just um, quickly, um, one of the things that was intriguing to me, though, um, it always has been intriguing to me, is that prophets often have to do the opposite of what they were expecting. Now, I was thinking in terms of also thinking about, you know, Abraham and, like, he's supposed to go there and sacrifice Isaac, and then, oops, sorry, psych, that's not what's going to happen. And so one of the things that I wonder about prophets is, um, people tend not to be open to being wrong about basically everything. So is, you know, the, the openness to say, hey, psych, I didn't get it right. The openness also to say, I thought I knew what God was sending me to do, but it turns out I had completely the wrong idea. Is that an essential characteristic also? So as, as an interesting practice or a fascinating, because I think it's a fascinating uh, question, one of the things we can do is we can go back into the Bible and view the different episodes of you know, starting with Abraham, continuing to Moses, going on to the later prophets and viewing what's going on. Essentially, the feeling is many times that if we've gotten some prophetic revelation, then we're going to stick to it no matter what, mm -hmm. you know, even if everyone's thinking otherwise. Um, and, you know, I think that just as interesting as your question is perhaps we, we often hear of prophets who go back to God and say they're not listening. But very few, if any, of the prophets that said to God, I think you got it wrong. <laughs> exactly. You know? so, so it's this, this question. It's sort of, I, so I think it's fascinating to, to, to go back and try. And, and that's, I think, what Heschel was trying to do. It's also what right. Martin Bubba was trying to do. And what Herman Cohen, to a certain st extent, was trying to do is to sort of go back to these prophets and really try and understand, you know, put them on a Freudian couch and understand, you know, what's going on in their mind, you know, really trying to understand from a sort of 360 degree as opposed to many times. So I, I think, you know, you're spot on and it really is worth trying to look more into those angles because it's, it's a fascinating question. Um, we have time maybe for one or two more questions. Um, um, I think we're, we're, we're running out. Yes, we're, oh, we're, we're, yeah, right. We're yes. run out of time. Yes. Thank you, so much, yes. Thank you so much, friends. Thank you so much, friends, for joining this great event. Thanks, Johnny, for-, for You can email anything you class. want. Feel free to email any follow-up questions. Uh, um, it's been lovely. Thank you very, very much.